Well, I don't think it's possible to agree any more uh, with Nate than right then. We rarely ever agree. Um, but to, just in agreement of, man, if there is something within worship or within a message, if I get interrupted with amens, if I get interrupted, interrupted with clapping, that's like a good thing, okay? So we welcome that to express what God is doing and how he's moving you and just to give him the honor and praise. Not a, not a speaker, not a song, not a, a worship team, not you know any certain thing other than his name. So that is super awesome. Hey, in two weeks from today, we're starting our vision series, which is called Gather, Scatter, Matter. This is who we are as a church. We've been called to love and lead. And how we do that is we gather in large environments like this. We scatter into community groups and then specifically into serving by mattering, investing our life deeply in the lives of other people. And so it's mattering. It's pouring out our time, treasure, our talent. We're going to be talking about that through the month of August. And like we talked about last week, it's a great opportunity to invite someone to be here with you. So on August 6th, if you, if you haven't already, start inviting some people to come. It's going to be a clear presentation of, of who Jesus is and get connected to all of that. And so I want to invite you to invite people to come, make plans now for people to be here with us. Um, it'll be awesome. And on the communication card, you can write their name. We're not going to call and be like, hey, we're going to kidnap you on August 6th, okay? <laughs> Nothing like that. It's just a way we can begin to pray for them now. And so... Super good stuff going on. Gather, Scatter, Matter is something that we talk about during Rock Harbor Is, and I know the guys mentioned that a little bit earlier, and we have that today just following this service. It works out perfect. You guys can get done and head over that way. If you want to go that you ha and you haven't signed up, just let them know at the tent. I mean, Costco's open. We'll get more food. Go get some fried chicken, and we're going to have a party. And so uh, make sure to be there with us. There's actually sandwiches and some other healthy stuff like grapes and stuff, but I don't touch that. So there's going to be plenty of that sitting around for you. Great day to be here. Here's why. We're back in the book of Joshua, and Harrop, uh, which is also Scott Harrop, executive pastor Scott Harrop, I shouldn't just call him Harrop or Scotty or other pet names I have for him, um, but he was speaking and began our Strong and Devoted series back in, was it 1st of June? So I got a chance to catch up and uh, just love where he got us taken off, and so we're going to be jumping into Joshua 20 and 21 today. Um, Cool thing about this weekend's message was I was struggling with it. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I was struggling with, okay, where is this going? What, how do I do this? And what do I communicate? And God, would you just please help me? And God, uh, last week I felt really good about, and this week I don't feel good. Help me, Lord, you know? And I was doing one of those pray prayers like, dear God, I have a test tomorrow. Would you please help me? I know I haven't studied, Lord. Um, it was one of those kind of messages. I just was having a hard time connecting. And then all of a sudden, things started coming together. And it's amazing how God's word, through his spirit at work in us, brings like from our confusion to his perfect clarity. And so I'm very thankful for that, that I feel like we got some clear direction on what, what the word says and excited to dive in to that. Um, but we're going to do it backwards, okay? So we're going to start in chapter 21 and work our way back to chapter 20. The first point today is rest in God's promises, to rest in God's promises. We're going to be talking about rest, and each one of the points talks about promises. Nate, the song that they just did was promises. We didn't even plan that. Nate had a week off or a week, a sabbatical. He had a, a week-long sabbatical this week. He, said, he texted me on Monday and said, hey, do you look at the order? And I'm like, need to get to that. I never looked at it, okay? And so I had no idea where this was going, but God had a perfect plan uh, together for that. And so it's cool how that's lined up. Joshua 21, 43 through 45 says this. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they settled there. The Lord gave them rest. If you like to underline, highlight, circle, carve into your arm, gave them rest is something good to do that with. On every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers, not one of their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed all came to pass. All the good promises. That's another thing to circle and, and underline and highlight. He gave them rest and he gave them all of the good promises. The thing about the rest is it says they had rest on every side. So they had just come in. They've taken the promised land. There was lots of enemies, lots of people that would oppose them, that wanted the land. They were jealous of what had happened or they're thinking, hey, they're weak. They're not organized yet. Let's go in and take over. But yet God gave them rest. They didn't have to worry about these attacks that were all around them. See, the rest that you and I are looking for is one that only comes from God. Rest is something that we believe 
that God is who he says he is and that he keeps his promises. We can rest in that. We can rest in the fact that God is who he says he is and he keeps all of his promises. So I have a question for you. Are you rested? Are you rested? A dude in the front row last service was like, that's right. And I'm like, he's like literally laying down. And, and I'm like, yeah, you're rested. And he's like, I haven't sat down in seven days. And I'm like, I'm preaching, bro, quiet down. Um, I didn't say that. He had a nice beard and he looked dangerous, so I didn't mess with him. But, but for some, I mean, it, what if we were to ask your, your family and said, hey, are they rested? What would your kids say? What would they say at work? Are you rested? Because, I mean, it's almost like, I mean, you think about our culture We've got a question that we ask, when, you know, when you see people and you're like, hey, what's up? Hey, what's, what's happening? Hey, what's crack a lacking? Or whatever. One thing we say is, you been busy? You busy? We ask that question. It's almost as if, like, if you say no, then, like, you're a loser. You know, if you say yes, then that's, like, good. That's a good thing. Hey, yeah, I'm, I've been really busy. You know, it's like, hey, you been busy? And somebody's like, no, I'm, I'm resting in the Lord. That's when it's like, dude, I want to smack you. You know, you're just like, like seriously, I'm never going to talk to you again. Um, like literally not going to talk to you again. Um, but think about that. Are you busy? It's something we aspire for. Like the busy we are, the, the more trips, the more vacations, the more little things, the more hectic. Like, yeah, man, we've been super busy. Um, and other times like, we've been so busy. And you've been saying that for 10 years. You know, you've been, oh, we've been so busy. So what does rest look like? You know, you weren't created to be busy. You were created to be restful. You weren't created for busy. You were created for rest. That's how God designed you and I. But sadly, we chase after this busyness because other people are doing this or there's these different things that are going on in our life. And I grew up in a sweaty Baptist church. Uh, not everybody grew up in church, but I did, and my Baptist church was sweaty. Okay, anybody else sweaty Baptist church? I feel for you. Okay, other people in the crowd? You're blessed, okay? <laughs> but I grew up in one of those, and something that was said often is if sa- Satan can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. You know, Satan can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. And isn't that true? Like if, you know, he can get us caught up in a bunch of things that don't actually matter. And in the middle of Joshua, as they're given this promised land and they're ready to get busy about building houses and building cities and, and laying down some roots. I mean, they've been slaves for so long. They've been sleeping in tents, and they're just like ready And he says, rest. And I'm going to give you rest on all sides. And I'm going to fulfill my promises to you. Verse 44, and he gave him rest. Rest is more than sleep. Although there's nothing like a really good nap. Let's just be honest. You know, I got two on Friday. That's my wife, too. She's like, this is your second nap. And I'm like, I love you, too. You know, I'm like, (laughs) like, it's super. Would you like to talk on the new patio furniture? Nope, that we got on 75% discount because uh, we uh, were gone and we picked it up in July. So I'm, I'm like, no, honey, I want to go take a nap. So it's like there's nothing like a little bit of rest, but rest is so much more than getting a nap. It's really resting. And it's not just resting because of the week that you had. It's resting prior to what's going to happen. You're not rest, resting just from this experience. And how many times have you said that? Like, I'm so tired. I just need the weekend to get here. I just, I need to rest. I'm so, ex- I mean, you're looking backwards as you're trying to rest. When we need to be looking forward into what God may want to do in and through us. The fourth commandment talks about it. It says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. What do you think that meant as Moses shared that and as this is coming out and this is the law of God to a group of people that have been slaves for generations? You get a day off. As a slave, you never get a day off. Every day is the same. Every day is a work day. And then all of a sudden, like, hey, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Get a day of rest. The truth is, is many of us have become slave to our boss, our business, our own identity, If you can't take a day off, you probably are a slave to something. Even to success, even to maybe what would be good things. Well, my kid's really good at this, or they could be good at this, or maybe this is the thing that's going to get them that scholarship. Just being a smart dad, you know, let's play the odds, and if they play this sport, maybe it's going to happen. You know, you start thinking next thing you know, you're chasing something that you may never actually land at. Rest. What's it like to have a restful heart? More than 
sleep, but be at peace. This rest that's talked about in Joshua is also mentioned in the New Testament a couple times, and the word that's used is peace. How do we really have peace? See, early church rabbis, the rabbis would say things like, this fourth commandment is a hinge commandment. And what they meant by that was the first three were focused on God, right? No other gods before me, no graven image, do not worship any idols, and, and do not take my name in vain. Honor God, then rest. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Why? Because you need that rest for the next six, five through ten. It's all about people. It's all about everything, all those relationships that we have in our life and how to honor God through that, and the rest is the only thing that helps us turn that corner. You know relationships require rest? Some of you, you get energy by being around people. The more you're around people, the more excited you get. You're like, yeah, this is awesome. I just love being around people, and I'm I'm fueled up. Even you need rest for relationships, because some of you are like, man, if I could just get away, a day away from people, that would make me so happy. Like, I mean, I love them and all, but getting time away, I get fueled up from that. So it's rest for all of us. It's needed for the relationships, those, those commandments that we've been given. Think about God and his creation as he created heaven and earth and light and day and night and day and light and dark and dark and light, you know, and it's the, the heavens and the earth and the, the, the land and the water, and then he created the animals and then man. And on the seventh day he rested. Was God tired? No, the Bible says God never sleeps nor slumbers. He wasn't tired, but he was so pleased with what he had created. He was so well pleased at the work that had been done. And guess what? The first day of Adam's life after being created was one of rest. Lots of work to do, right? You got to name the animals, you got exploring, you got stuff to do, you got a mission, a calling, because God had put in Adam this work ethic. You know, you've been built with a work ethic. So if you just have a rest ethic, <laughs> it's probably a little something going on there. You might need to. Like, do something. Um, But you've been built with that. There's something about accomplishing things and and using what God has gifted us with in our life physically, in our hands, in our mind, to be active for his work. Lots to do. But God said, I'm going to create you, and I'm going to rest, and you're going to rest with me. To really rest. See, as a follower of Jesus, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you can rest in the fact that it's been done for you. Rest in the fact that you have Jesus in you, that he has finished the work on the cross. He has risen from the dead. This is Christ's finished work. The work's been done. If you've yet to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, what you're going to hear over and over today, he's a refuge. He's a place of rest for you. He has paid, he has bought and sought and paid for your sin. And he's after you so that you would find rest. The rest that can only come from him. Often we let our identity be in the things that we do or don't do. When in fact our identity should be in what has been done for us. Not what we've done, but what's been done for us. We can rest in that. And maybe you came in today with just an incredible weight or burden. Just You're exhausted from some things in life. Maybe you've dealt with some stress or some loss or some suffering and just maybe it's just I mean you're literally like the dude in the front row you're like I'm sitting down for the first time and I don't know how long it feels good and Keith's voice is melodic and I'm just ready to go to sleep for Jesus he said to rest I just want to obey the word you know if that's you welcome to the club because that's me when I'm not talking so but maybe you just got the weight of the world on your shoulders there's a little song that we teach kids and it's He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got all of it in his hands. Can we just rest? And remember, we have this little reminder that every day we get tired and every day we need some sleep is a reminder that the world still revolves even when you're sleeping. It doesn't revolve around you. And you may bear a lot of weight. You may say, Keith, that sounds really good in church. But the truth is, is I've got some bills. I've got some things. I've got some stuff that's weighing me down. And I have to deal with it when I walk out of here. Or it's going to hit me like a ton of bricks tomorrow. And I just want you to know that through Christ and through Scripture, I pray that your heart can feel that rest, even in turmoil. There's a couple of different ways that we feel attacked. 
And this attack, as it shares, it says they had rest on every side. Rest on every side. What does that mean for us? Because Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary laden, and I will give you rest. And I love where that verse goes in the second part. It continues on it. Basically, Jesus repeats himself. So it's just not me when I'm preaching. Jesus, or you as a parent when you're doing your lectures with your kids, okay? You're not just, it's, it's a Jesus thing. Because he adds two words that change it. I will give you rest for your soul. That was three words. Anyways, he gives you rest for your soul. And you know what that means? More than just physical, more than just like my mind is so tired, my emotions are so tired, that in the depths of who you are, he will bring rest to you. But they had rest on all sides because all those around them wanted to attack them. And he said, quiet, not my people. He brought his rest. The attack that we see from all the different sides are things from our past, our present, and our future. Some of you, your rest is being stolen from something in your past. God's grace is bigger than your addiction. God's grace is bigger than your affair. You're not your abortion. You're not your failed marriage. You're not whatever it would possibly be. That's what I love about Rock Harbor is we get to hear stories of about every possible situation and every possible sin and every possible thing that could happen in anyone's life, and we get to see the redemption. We get to hear the story of only God, and I cannot believe, and time after time through groups and through Sunday messages and through videos we're allowed that where we share or we, we, through our student ministry sharing different things going on in all our different environments and serving together, and you find out this about this person, and you're like, Man, I thought you had it all together. No, we're tore up from the floor up. We all got problems. We all have issues. We all have struggles. And then you get to hear people share that because we won't be defined by those things. The Bible's clear about it. God's message is clear about it. But guess what else you don't have to be defined by? Your successes either. Your successes. Your resume. How things look. Because those things you brag about, oh man, yeah, this is what's going on, and my kid's this, and I have six kids, and they're all all all-stars, and they're just great, and this other mom's like, I got two kids, and you're dumb, you know? Why why do you have six children? You are crazy. And so their success is someone else's failure, and then you can judge one another and just have fun with that at Settlers Park, okay? But (laughs) if we're just defined by our successes, then what good is that? Because anything that's good comes down from God. And you've been gifted in ways, and it should be ultimately for his glory. You know, the works that we do only ultimately end up in us being unworthy. But the faith that we have in what God has done for us makes us worthy. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. See, there's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Condemnation, we feel guilty, the shame comes in, we want to run away and hide. We're embarrassed. Think about a condemned house. You don't, if that's your home and that's where you're living, you don't want to have any guests over, much less the king of kings, right? And what does God do? He moves in. He wants to dwell with us. He walks through your hoarding and your mess and your, I'm going to fix that. And I I know I'm a painter and I've never painted my house. And I know I install these things, but I've never installed my own thing because I'm just busy about stuff. But God, just, we, can you just let me clean it up? And he moves in and he says, I want to dwell with you. I want to abide with you. I want to sup with you. Not like sup with you, like. Sup with you. No, he wants to eat with you. He wants to be with you. That was so dumb. And like 18 of you laughed, and three of you felt sorry for me. And some of you are going to realize, like at another point, that that was incredible. Okay? Someone is going to be like, sup with you, you know? But that's what he wants to do with us. He also wants, you know, the conviction Rather than the condemnation that makes us want to cower and hide, conviction is where we run to a father with open arms. Because he's come to us with his grace and we know he's forgiven us and he welcomes us and he invites us in and he says, let me admonish you and correct you, but most importantly, let me love you. Let me forgive you. Let me restore you. Let me clean up that house. Let me, not 
would you hurry up and let me do that for you? That's what conviction looks like. And that's what it means to abide with him. So if we can set aside those things from our past that can steal from us. For some of you, you feel attacked by your current circumstances. Maybe you've got kids, you've got marriages, you've got some things in your life that are bringing stress to you. It could be financial situation, but it's brought a heavy weight upon you. Jesus said in John 14, hey, take heart. I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm so good. This is God speaking. I am so good and so loving and so gracious that I am over all things. I am God the Father. But I am sending God the Son to die for you and to raise from the dead, and he's going to come back for you. Yet also I'm going to send God the Holy Spirit, the comforter, so he can be with you. Take heart, you have a comforter. Take heart, you have a counselor in your current circumstance. Jesus says, I've said these things to you that you may have peace. John 16, that peace is the same one mentioned in Joshua, the same root word. And in this world, you're going to have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Would you just flip and chill out? Would you just chill out? Take heart. You're going to have tribulation. You are going to suffer. You know why? Because we're not there yet. Eternity awaits us, but eternity hangs in the balance for now. Take heart and begin to live like people who are not of this world because there is a place that awaits you. The arms of the Savior are here with you. The Comforter is here with you. Yet there's a place that he's gone before to prepare for us. Take heart. And why do we worry about tomorrow? For tomorrow will worry about itself, Jesus said. There's going to be plenty of things to have anxiety about in the future. And some of us have been attacked by the few things in the future of our lives. I think about that and I think about being a dad. I think about like I, I want to take care of my kids. And I worry, am I doing a good have I prepared enough? Have I saved enough? Do we have anything for college? Because we have so many children. Dear God, be with all the state programs that are going to send my kids to college. You know, I'm just thinking like, Lord, I, I just worry sometimes about that. Is there any other dads that worry about what maybe their kid is doing right now <laughs> or what they have done or what they're going to do, but there's a bit of worry about the future? Okay, quite a few dads. The ones that won't admit that, like, you need to see a counselor, okay? So, and I'm not the guy, so I'll pray for you, okay? Um, but there's some stuff there, and the truth is, is we worry about that. You know why? Because good dads want to give good gifts to their kids, and good dads want, what is, want great things for their kids. A good dad loves his kids. And I was thinking about the 4th of July when we were in Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm thinking, man, when's the last time I got something good for our kids? And we went to a fireworks stand, and I just wanted to get them something good, like awesome. And maybe I'm a pyro, but anyways, I was like, it was for the kids, I promise you. But as we were looking at all those family packs, and we're kind of looking, and we're starting to pick out stuff, I'm like, We need that one right there. It's like the big daddy. Like the stuff that's not legal in Idaho is legal in Florida. Because Florida won't burn. It's never going to burn. They're just like, yeah, fire it up. Let's make money on it, you know. Like this is awesome. And I'm like, we can get mortars legally. Okay, so let's do this. And so we're looking around and Christina's like, let's get sparklers. And I'm like, yes, let's get sparklers too. Let's let's be good parents. Let's, Let's do this thing. And we walk out and I'm like, this is awesome. Super excited. Get to the beach. We're just ready. People start shooting stuff off. I'm like, now's the time. So we get out the sparklers. We had so many sparklers. My wife's giving them away to people so they can burn themselves. Like, hey, kid, come here, burn yourself, you know? And they're like, oh, you know, we're shooting videos. We're all excited. Like, this is so much fun. And all I could do is I'm like, this is great. But I'm like looking over at the big ones. I'm like, come to daddy. This is going to happen for the kids, okay? And so I'm super excited, ready to roll. There's only one problem. I've never done mortars before. So I'm like, okay. So I'm reading legally. Like, I have never done them, okay? I'm like super excited about it because it's like legal, like we're going to do this thing. So I'm reading the instructions. I'm ready to go. I go set it up. We get the kids put around. We're like, guys, this is going to be awesome. They're all pumped. I'm like, okay, I'm going to light it and then turn my video camera on and it's going to be really good. Let's just put it this way. It did not go well and the firework did not go in the air and it might have come at us like we were at war. Okay. (laughs) It was scary. If you don't believe me, watch the video. (laughs) 
Okay, I might have evil laughed at that after that, but oh, there it goes again, dude! Stop! I'm having flashbacks. But it's, it's going, and you can, I mean, it like comes at you. It comes at you, okay? And so what does a good dad do? A good dad tries it again. And so I'm like, okay, guys, scoot a little further back. We got it this time. <laughs> so I do it again. It doesn't go up. It goes more to the, there's more ground cover. It comes at you, and I'm like, whoa, this is scary. This is freaky, you know? The people next to us did not think it was funny at all. <laughs> And I'm not thinking it's funny. I'm actually scared, but I'm trying to be cool. I'm trying to be like, oh, hon, I'm not sure I read the instructions. She's like, well, honey, you need to, like, are you sure you read them? I'm like, yes, I read them, okay. And so we went and did it again. It went to the ground. So after two, I'm like, that is not working, you know. But as I'm walking back, the neighbor that's enjoying the free fireworks display or risking their life, they decide to come make it known to me that (laughs) I don't know what I'm doing. And as they walk up, they say, what the beepity beep? And I'm like, I don't even understand. We don't talk like that in Idaho. And so they're saying all of these things, and I'm walking towards them. And the dude's about 24, and he's coming at me. And I'm like, I might as well walk towards him. And so I said, I looked at him, and I said, I read the instructions. And Chris is like, nice one, nice one. I read the instructions. You know, I'm like, I read the instructions. And he's like, well, you need to figure it out. And I said, I looked at him, and I was like, I'm trying his girlfriend, or this lady, sitting in her Tommy Bahama chair, she's sitting over here, and she goes, well, you need to figure it out, because there are people, you're going to hurt somebody, and I'm, I looked at her, and I said, do you honestly think I would hurt my kids? I'm a dad, I got all the kids. I'm not going to hurt my kids. It got super quiet. And then I said, I'm a pastor, and do you know Jesus? No, I never said that. Um, <laughs> I said, do you honestly think I'm going to hurt my kids? And then all of a sudden, the third dude goes, bro, I got a pretty cool Snapchat video of that. <laughs> and I'm like, thanks, man. So I went back. They left. <laughs> we scared the fire out of them. They left. And I did what any good dad would do. And I took the fireworks and I went and threw them in the trash can because I'm like, dude, it's not worth it. I am just kidding. We did it again. They were gone. The neighbors were shooting bottle rockets at each other. And Roman candles were like, boo, boo. I'm like, it's our turn, kids. Build a bunker. So we built a bunker. We got it ready to go. And I went out. We scooted further away because I am a good dad who loves his children. And we lit it off. And the next four worked gloriously. It was just glory to God. They all worked. And everybody walked out safely, okay? Other than being a pyro and a little bit of a crazy person, it was so super exciting to give a good gift. But the point of, I would never harm my children. Come on, people. Think about God's love for you. He would never harm his children. He would never intentionally hurt his children. Think about the love that we have from a human standpoint, that how much we as humans would love our children. And put that aside. And that's just like grains of sand compared to the beach of love that God has poured out for us that is irrational and restful. That's a gift from God. I trust that promise. I trust that hope because that same God has given us a promised land. He's given us his promises, but he's also given us his promised land. That's where your life is more than just head knowledge about who God is. It's heart surrender to live and abide and dwell with him. It's a transition from life, from death to life. See, Joshua and God's chosen people were given the promised land. And you look through chapter 13 through 19. And all throughout it, you see how it's, the land is being divided up. And it's being divided up between all of the tribes. So you've got the tribe of Dan and Asher and Simeon and all these different, Benjamin. They're going all over. And it's an area a little bit bigger than the Treasure Valley. So it'd be like the cities that we see here. And it's in a bigger space. Remember, they didn't have transportation like us. And so they're spread out quite a distance apart. And he says, go and make cities. And they all got a different land and a different space. It would be like somebody living in Nampa and Cuna and Eagle and Meridian and Boise and all throughout this valley. 
But yet there was a group of people called the Levites and, and they were the chosen. There was a special group of people who did the sacrifices and they, they led in worship and God used them and called them. And what was a troubled past that they had had as a group of people, God chose them, redeemed them. Whole nother story, but amazing testimony to God's plan of redemption. And he brings them, yet this group comes to God and says, we don't have a place, Lord. God says to them, I'm your portion. I am your inheritance. I'm all that you need. And they're feeling it. And then they walk away and they go, but we do need a place to live. Like literally God, like where are we supposed to go? Like that sound, that Braveheart speech, God sound really good, but where are we gonna live? And it's almost like young couples that will say like, we don't need money, we're just gonna live on love. That's what we used to say. You know what people say now? We're just going to live on love and Netflix. That's what we're going to live on. We know how that works, right? It doesn't work. So they're asking God, where do you want us to live? And so God sets apart, and this is in chapter 20, God sets apart 48 Levitical cities. Get this. This is so incredible. It's not that I want you in one place. I want you all over because I want to I wanna dwell among you. And these places you go, they will provide for you and they will give you refuge and they will give you place to live and food to eat and they will take care of you because I want to dwell among you. But out of these 48 cities, I want six, six cities of refuge. And I want them to be in proximity that anybody who needs refuge within a day's travel, they can be there and they can get the safety that they need. Why do we need that? Well, chapter 20 of Joshua says, the Lord said to Joshua, say to the people of Israel, appoint the cities of refuge of which I spoke to you through Moses. By the way, Joshua, this ain't new news. You guys have been preparing and planning for this and knowing about this for a very long time. Generations, you knew these cities were coming because God had foresight and he was planning all along to take care of your broken and hurting heart. And if this is you, I hope you hear this message that he is with you no matter what you're in. And it's been his plan all along to rescue you and redeem you and restore your broken and tired heart. Here's why we need these cities. Verse three, that the manslayer who strikes any person without intent or unknowingly may flee there. They shall be for you a refuge from the avenger of blood. So if someone accidentally takes someone's life, it's a work-related accident, something happens, they can have a safe place to go. Here's why. God's law was if someone murders someone, their life was to be lost. But what if it was an accident? And that person's claiming, hey, it was an accident. The word gets around and they're so upset and they're lost that they're ready to take your life. And they, by law, were allowed to. And the oldest in that group or that family was supposed to do that. They were supposed to take action. It was a life for a life. And and why would that be? Why does this matter so much? Life matters to God. You were created in his image. Therefore, your life matters. All of us were created in his image. Therefore, all life matters. Born and unborn. All lives matter matter immensely to God and he's saying you matter to me and I value human life but this person shall flee these cities and they shall stand at the entrance of the gate in the city and explain his case to the elders of the city and then they shall take him into the city and give him a place and he shall remain with them the avenger of blood it sounds like a Marvel character right It's just a family member doing what was the law. Yet sometimes there wasn't a proper court case and things would happen and God said, I don't want this to happen anymore. We need a safe place. So this group of people has been living in tents for 40 years. They have, finally they can build a house. Finally, with brick and mortar, they can form up these things so that they can build a city and put gates on it and be able to do all that they dreamed of. And they're out of slavery. And then there's this promise and then there's this instruction. 
that yes, rest in the promised land, my people, but you better share in that rest in that promised land. And as these who are seeking refuge come in, receive them, provide for them, do what's right for them. Because there were times it wasn't an individual, it was an entire family. They were fleeing for their life because that avenger of blood was going to kill someone. Was gonna go. They had to pay. Yet God in his graciousness said, no, 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 no. Guess what? It's not just for the Jewish people that live within our borders, but outside of those borders, you can come into this safe place. Isn't it incredible? The pictures of the word that I was trying to figure out and trying to understand. And it's almost as if if you haven't heard it already, I pray that you understand like this is what the church is supposed to be. The church is supposed to be this. Because guess what? Those cities of refuge, they had gates just like every other city. And when it got dark, all the other cities shut their gate. Why? For the safety of the people, because you never know what could happen. But not the cities of refuge. They keep their gates wide open all night long. Why even put gates on, right? Why even put gates on? So it will be a visual reminder, symbolic of the openness and the hearts that we are to have to God and whatever God would want to do. And the arms of Jesus wide open. Look at the gates. They're wide open. You show me a church with the gates closed and I will show you a church that is dying and has lost mission of what we've been called to do. And that is to seek and to save the lost. Let us not be a church that closes our gates or once we have our brick and once we have our mortar, we'll have a safe place for us to have our kids and we'll protect them. Close the gates, it's getting late. Close the gates, it's getting crazy. The world's just going to hell in a handbasket. We're just okay, let's hunker down. That couldn't be further from the truth. And my God keeps his promises. So I will look at that and I will call that a lie. And we as a church need to stand up against that and fight against our flesh because our flesh wants to shut it down. Our flesh wants eternity now. We want safety now. We want freedom now. We want, uh, God, would you please just give me a little bit more money so I can pay the bills? I'm just going to take care of it. God's poured his blessings out and we kind of do this. Let's not be people that do this with every resource that's been given to us, whether financial, whether in gifts, whether in talents, those things in life that matter. Let's be people that open our hearts and open our arms and open our homes to people without. Get this. God's promises is a head thing. We got to hear it. We got to believe it. God's promised land is him taking up residence in our heart. It's a head to the heart thing. This is where salvation takes place. Forgiveness takes place. And a calling of being on mission for God. Yet it's a hands thing when we open our arms. Open your arms to those who need refuge. Because there was some clear instruction to the church, to the cities. See, I've already done this in my mind but I want to share it with you. What if we took out the word city in that verse and we put church? We'd hear this. He shall flee to one of these churches and he shall stand at the entrance of the gate of the church and explain his case to the elders of that church and they shall take him into the church and give him a place and they shall remain with him. It's been an incredible five years, but it's only just begun. And we need cities of refuge that are just a short distance from everyone. There's some vision in that statement. And we will not always be one church at one location. We have planted churches, and at some point, we are going to plant other churches and other rock harbors and multi-sites. It has just begun what God is doing. But we'll never become that church if we can't become those people, because the church is the people. We have to be those people. God instructed his people very clearly in scripture. And he said to them, if there is a mountain, move it. If there is water, build a bridge. If it is rocky, make a road. 
so that they can come and find refuge. He even to the point says, put a sign out so it is very clear because these people are fleeing for their life. But we're inside the gates and that would be work. I can't possibly say this without getting emotional. But you have got to know, and I have got to know, and we have got to live knowing we will be in eternity someday and there will ultimately be rest. But the rest that God has for us comes with the arms being wide open. That rest you're seeking only comes from Him. And when you open your arms and you watch the lost be found, and when you watch the broken be healed and we, you watch what is yours become his you have stepped into rest because you're touching the hem of eternity and verse number 6 talks about a high priest and it says for all those who have found refuge when a high priest dies you get to hit the reset button and you are set free as a refuge. You are set free. You no longer have to be in a place that you aren't from. You can go back home because the high priest has died. Think about that picture. His name's Jesus. He's the great high priest. Took on the form of a man for you and I and he died for us. When he rose from the dead, sin was paid for. And when we die to ourself and we become alive in him by seeking forgiveness of sins and knowing he's given us a gift that we could never earn or create on our own, he's given us salvation. Then and only then will we be free. And then and only then will we rest. Would you bow your heads with me? Just a couple of questions of reflection. Who would uh, just simply raise your hand and say, man, I need a rest. I need to sincerely rest. I'm not just tired in my physical body, but I'm just, I need rest. My heart, my mind. Who would raise your hand and say, that's me, I need some rest. Who would raise your hand and say, you know what? I need to offer some rest to someone else. I want my life to be a place, arms open wide, to bring rest of the promise, promises of God to other people. And I feel moved in my heart. Would you raise your hand? And lastly, who would say, I need the rest of Jesus. I need to seek forgiveness of sins and surrender my life to Jesus Christ for him to be my Lord and my Savior to receive that gift of rest that comes by forgiveness of sins and new life in Jesus Christ. Who would raise your hand and say, I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ today for that. Who would raise your hand and say, that's me. Amen. Incredible number of hands. Would you pray with me? Dear God, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Bring your rest through your son. Thank you for the gift in Jesus that I do not deserve. Thank you for dwelling with me, not condemning me, but rather bringing your grace and your love to me. I receive you as my savior. Thank you for the new life that I have in you. I ask this in the name above all names, the name of Jesus. Amen.